Hi, everybody. Welcome to our monthly Hope for Mental Health community here on the last Sunday in September. It's good to have you with us. Um, this month is Suicide Prevention Month, and we've spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, you'll want to go back if you didn't see some of the things that we've posted, um, particularly wanting to hear Dan Adams from Sources of Strength, um, an amazing presentation by Dan and conversation about um, positive suicide prevention, which sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, really an emphasis on resilience and what it is that people's strength that they bring to their challenges. You'll, you're going to want to watch that. Also, we posted um, an interview that I did a couple months ago with Dr. Christine Moutier, who's the medical director for um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Great conversation with her. She's always a moving and inspiring guest. And then um, last month when we talked to Dr. Casey Call about going back to school, and uh, in fact, we called it Back to School Support for Families. She's a professor at Texas Christian University and trauma, child trauma specialist and attachment. And she just gave us basically a, a, you know, in a box, how to do online schooling with your kids at home schooling. And it was fantastic, so encouraging. All of those can be found at kwarren.com um, forward slash community. And you can watch any of those uh, that I just mentioned on that. And, and I hope you will, such good information. And today I have uh, my really good friend, uh, Kyle Howard. Kyle James Howard is a, is a new friend of mine and I've been following on him on social media for a couple of years and, um, and then I've met him in person. And, um, and then today we get to have him with us. But um, in these past few months have, have our, our, our experience, you know, our, our lives have been shaped by the, um, by the latest deaths of, of unarmed black men and women. And these fresh wounds um, have just opened up some of the most uh, deep and profound conversations among all of us about race and violence and trauma you know, not just in our nation, but also in, in the body of Christ. How, how, are, how are these current events um, affecting the body of Christ, the faith community, and, and what do we need to be doing differently? And not just at a theoretical level, you know, not just in theory, what should we be doing, or, but, but really at the um, very personal level of the effect of injustice and trauma on the mental health of, of, of our Black brothers and sisters. And that's why I really wanted you to hear from Kyle. Um, he is a Christian theologian and trauma-informed soul care provider. He's earned a bachelor's degree in biblical counseling and is currently finishing an advanced master of divinity in historical theology. Kyle primarily counsels and lectures on racial and spiritual trauma in Christian spaces. And I just could not be more than delighted to have Kyle with us today. Kyle, it is so good to have you with us today. Um, we met a year ago at a, a conference called Caring Well, which was for, um, for uh, people who'd experienced sexual abuse in, in some churches. And we got to sit on the same row together and I got to meet you in person. I've been following you on social media uh, for about a year before that. But one of the things I've come to appreciate about you is your vulnerability um, I mean, man, you just lay it out there. You lay it out, not only what you think and you feel, but, but some of your experiences and so much so that it has led to some pretty serious, severe criticism of you down to, I mean, not even being melodramatic, but honestly, death threats and people say, I mean, it breaks my heart. Some, some of the most vile and vicious things that people say to you. Um, and, um, so I've followed you. I've watched how you respond with love and kindness. Uh, you don't let people run over you. You're not like, Hey, bring it on. You know, you're, you have good boundaries about that, but man, you take a lot of junk on there and I've watched you just be, um, you know, reasonable. You bring it back to, to your faith. You bring it back. You call people to repentance. You call people to what God has to say, but you know, how did you get to where you, this is where you are today, um, you know, tell, tell us if you wouldn't mind, just kind of um, your story, what you, um, where you grew up, a little bit about you. How did you end up to where you are now in Atlanta as uh, both, both a racial trauma counselor and a spiritual abuse counselor? Is that what you always intended? Is that where you were heading with your life? Or how did you get to where you are today? 
And I wanted to say, you have an amazing wife, V, who has her, I follow, you know, her as well. And she's got this custom dessert thing that I just drool every time I see her pictures and you're really good as a husband to post her beautiful pictures. You've got three little kids. You've got a fourth one on the way. You are a busy man. You're a young man. A lot has already happened in your life. So how did you get to where you are right now? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And yes, I, I strive to be my wife's biggest cheerleader. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, social media is, is a very interesting thing. When I, I do get a lot of uh, hostility on there. I, I try to interpret it as a, a great opportunity to abound in love. And so when I receive hate, I, I, in some, I, I don't want to say this in this kind of a sadistic way, but I, in some sense, I get excited. Like, this is an opportunity for me to love someone. And, and so speak, speak back in love towards hate. And, um, and, I, and I'll share a little bit about, you know, how I got to where I am, which kind of speaks to the other thing of transparency, where um, when you kind of go live the kind of life that I've lived and been through the kind of things I've been through and seen the kind of things that I've seen, um, the whole Christian facade thing just doesn't, you just don't have the energy for it. Um, and, um, and, and so I do strive to be as um, just transparent and honest as I can be in hopes that that transparency just really, um, uh, I guess, resonates with other people who are kind of tired of kind of living that facade or seeing that kind of facade within Christian circles. So um, I come from a family of lawyers, a multi-ethnic, um, multicultural family of lawyers. Uh, my mother is a civil attorney. Uh, she was born in Jamaica and uh, moved to, uh, started college at actually 14, moved to uh, uh, Bronx, New York from Jamaica. Um, and, um, and she's both Chinese and Jamaican. Uh, my father was born in inner city DC. He's black and white. And um, they met in law school in DC, ultimately moved to Atlanta where my brother and I were both born. I have one older brother who's also a lawyer. He was a state prosecutor for several years. He now serves with my family in their private practice. Uh, my mother was raising both my brother and I both to be lawyers. Some of my earliest memories have to deal with my mom uh, going through uh, uh, insane um, uh, practices or efforts to try to groom us to become lawyers. Um, some of that, excuse me. So like growing up, if my brother and I had an argument, instead of like just like bickering at us or telling us to be quiet my mom would uh, even at some point even make us put on suits and argue our cases in front of them uh, my dad would typically be the the um the judge uh, sometimes we'd invite cousins over to be the jurors and we would have to present our case and whoever won basically won that argument and uh growing up i was able to tell my mother no as long as i had a good defense for why I was saying that. Otherwise, there would be consequences. <laughs> and so uh, for my earliest memories, my mother was pruning me for public speaking, ultimately with the desire to become a lawyer. I was pursuing law school, but ultimately decided it was caught into ministry. But uh, when I turned 12 years old, my life changed radically. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but I remember simply you know, playing, doing what a normal 12-year-old uh, would be doing. And I was hit with a severe bout with depression. And it was so severe that it left me in a fetal position, just curled up, crying my eyes out. And all I knew is that I didn't know what was happening to me. I was confused and I knew that I wanted to die. And uh, for at that moment would begin an ongoing struggle with severe depression and, um, and suicidal ideations uh, that um, have fairly recently died down some, but... Um, still continue to this day. Uh, when I turned uh, 14, in the midst of the, the, depression, the depression bouts um, and just uh, feelings of isolation and bitterness, um, I ended up joining a gang and getting involved in gang activity, um, despite the fact that my parents were, I grew up with some of the most awesome parents. To this day, my mother and father are my best friends. Um, we talk every day on the phone. We talk like an hour every day on the phone. And so um, I, my parents were amazing parents. Uh, but just with my own uh, sin, as well as just issues with, with the uh, struggles that I had regarding mental health and everything else, I just found myself in a place of just profound bitterness. Um, I, was, um, I, I didn't really have a religious upbringing. Um, and so by this time, by the age of 14, I was pretty much an atheist, but I believed in God enough to know that I hated him. Mm 
And I hated him because of the, the kinds of tormenting is how I viewed it, uh, that I would have to experience that would come around just randomly in the midst of doing uh, just the most, you know, menial things and then just automatically just hit with this depression. And uh, so at 14, I began struggling with severe depression. And then at 18, uh, my life changed again. Um, at this point, I was actually engaged to my high school sweetheart, V. Um, we were engaged. Um, again, I was, uh, I was not a believer. And uh, I was actually uh, headed to my dorm uh, contemplating suicide. Um, I, had, I had a plan. I had everything worked out. And I was headed back to my dorm uh, to play things out. And on my way to my dorm, uh, I, there was actually a, a rap concert that was going on in the field. And I was actually a professional battle rapper at this time. Um, so I was heavy into music, close to signing a record contract. And so I was curious. And so I stopped to listen to what they were rapping about and heard that they were rapping about Jesus. And I remember laughing and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to leave. And so I began walking away. And then I'll never forget one of the men on stage, one of the guys on stage, he was probably about 20. In the middle of rapping, he just stops looks look, looks at me gets off the stage and then runs across an entire field and it just comes straight up to me and I'm like what is this guy doing and he comes up to me he didn't share the gospel but he basically said hey how you doing he introduced himself now mind you I would have looked very different right at this point I had a blue rag around my head I had a either a blunt or a cigarette, a black amount hanging from that bandana, uh, razor blade I would typically carry in my mouth at times. I mean, I looked very, very different. And But he just stopped and said, hey, I would like to get lunch with you, man. Let's chop it up. Let's talk. And so I, I agreed just out of curiosity uh, to meet with him the following day. And at that point, I decided not to go through with the plans that I had. And I met with them for lunch. And I met with him and a couple other men and they began basically meeting with me every um, so often, just having lunch with them. And I was that guy that was asking them a ton of questions, kind of with that lawyer background, super inquisitive, trying to catch them up in slips. And when they didn't know the answer to something, they would just tell me and say, we'll try to find it out and come back and tell you. And so that continued on for um, several months uh, into a turning point on November 15th of 2003, my freshman year of college where um, the preacher preaches kind of, it was a campus ministry. He preached this sermon and I, I had to be one of the most classical, what must I do to be saved? I just walked up crying. It was like, what must I do to be saved? And the thing was that they constantly kept telling me that, hey, I, all you need to do is say this prayer. And I would tell them that, no, I need more than a prayer to save me. You don't know the things that I've done. Uh, I need more than a prayer. And so th at this point, they kind of got, ex at least this guy got a somewhat exasperated with me, refusing to say this prayer. And so he tells me, I'm asking, what must I do to be saved? And he's like, hey, just say this prayer. And I'm like, no, I need more than a prayer. I'm really going to hell. I need to be saved. And he said, well, why don't you just go up to the attic and cry out to God for him to save you? And I told him, well, that makes way more sense. So I, I went up to the attic. A couple of the men that were been building with me came up to the attic with me. And I literally cried out to God, God, if you will, then save me. And he showed up. He showed up in a radical way. And, um, and I, yeah, <laughs> it, was a, it was an encounter. And I left that moment never the same. I literally walked out that building and it was like the trees were a different color green. It was like everything was just different. And um, I ended up dropping out of college, getting a job, working just enough to provide a roof over my head and food for my stomach. And I spent all my other time just reading the Bible, trying to understand what happened to me. I read through the whole Bible six to eight times within my first year as a believer, just trying to understand uh, what happened to me. Um, I know my wife, my fiance at the time thought I was crazy when I came and told her everything that just happened. <laughs> but she stuck with me um, and we got married. And in 2012, um, I decided, my wife and I decided to move to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where I would begin uh, seminary training to be a pastor. And uh, it was uh, my ambition at the time was to be a pastor of a small church somewhere. I was a history nerd. So I wanted to study history and theology and maybe, with, you know, pastor a small church and write some books on history and theology. And that basically be my life. And um, I decided I was 26, 27 years old, had two small kids. I needed to finish my undergrad as soon as possible. I already had an associate's and I was doing, I was a preaching major. 
I, I took a couple preaching classes, realized that it wasn't for me because I already had training in public speaking. And so I looked at biblical counseling and decided to take that only for the purpose that biblical counseling degree major didn't require the biblical languages. I wanted to take the languages, but it was like, I need to get my undergrad. I need to get some kind of degrees under my belt, you know, uh, you know, with being a husband and father. And so I took the biblical counseling just to bypass the, uh, the, uh, the languages and figured I'd take that for my master's. And I took one class on biblical counseling and I was just hooked. Uh, just the idea of of applying the word of God to uh, personal uh, needs and challenges and struggles just had me completely uh, taken, especially given my past and and the current struggles that I was going through. And so, I I came headlong into Christian counseling. Uh, I ultimately graduated magna cum laude uh, from Boyce College, and then I began doing an advanced MDiv uh, in historical theology. Now. Still with that same ambition, when, once I graduated with, uh, f- with biblical counseling degree, it's like the Lord, the, like the day I graduated, the Lord opened up doors for people with counseling needs to come to me. I was a lay leader in the church at the time, but it was like I graduated and then crisis counseling needs just immediately arose, multiple ones. At, I think at one point I had like 10 different crisis counseling needs all going on at one specific time. And so that was basically like my life. And I loved it. I, I was, as I was caring for people, I saw them thriving. I saw them abounding in grace. And it was like, this is what God has called me to do. Um, at that round around the same time, uh, we, though we didn't know it, we didn't have words to define it at this time. My wife and I both began experiencing spiritual abuse ourselves within our local church context. And so as I was providing care, and my ministry is comprehensive, my soul care ministry is comprehensive, so marriage counseling, single counseling, all kinds of things, I was getting more and more uh, trauma counselees coming to me who had experienced abuse in their life, and I was caring for them while at the same time was being spiritually abused myself. And that would go on for about a year and a half to two years before I actually began to realize that I was actually in a, a spiritually abusive place. And, and, um, and so as I was caring for more people, um, more of the more hashtags were coming about uh, of unarmed black men and women being killed uh, by police. And um, I began getting more and more counselees who are minorities who, who had symptoms of trauma, uh, but it was all rooted in racial experiences that they had either within the broader culture their local church or the seminary context. And so at that point, I didn't have, with my biblical counseling degree didn't provide much in regards to uh, trauma care, especially racial trauma care. That was a non-category. And I don't believe, I believe is largely a non-category uh, within uh, predominantly white evangelical spaces. And so I had to kind of formulate my own uh, uh, philosophy of counseling and methodology uh, for race-based trauma care. And so I began doing that work and developing that, uh, I guess you could say that practice and began uh, providing soul care for people who um, uh, struggled with spiritual trauma or race-based trauma. And again, all while experiencing those things myself. Uh, 2017 uh, was what we call the dark year, my wife and I. It was a year where everything in regards to spiritual abuse, racial trauma came to a head in our own life. And um, there wasn't a day of that year where my wife and I did not cry on our couch and just weep. And um, uh, though for several years I hadn't struggled with any suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideations, that year it was pretty much a weekly challenge. Um, And um, yeah, it it, it got really, really bad. Um, But out of that, came the ministry that I do now, which is, and what I'm devoted to now, which is providing uh, soul care uh, for those who've experienced both spiritual trauma as well as racial trauma within the church and doing it without any charge to them. Um, I I have donors who uh, support that work. And so I use the money that they provide so that I'm able to provide free soul care to people who have experienced, uh, again, spiritual trauma, racial trauma. Uh, under the conviction that I don't believe that people who have been abused or traumatized by the church should have to pay for their own soul care. And so the experiences that I've had um, and the things that I've gone through, um, the challenges have ultimately served uh, me in uh, developing a ministry now where I'm able to care for other people 
in hopes that I can help them not have to go through what my wife and I had to go through um, in, all, in our lives and in our ministries. And so that's, that's basically what I've been committed to and been working on ever since. You, you are a young man and you have already lived a, a lifetime um, of experiences, um, seriously, of, of positive, um, you know, um, you, you've come to Christ, you've seen, you've seen the transform, transformative power of the gospel in your own life. So this is not theory for you. You've, you've, um, my goodness, you, you know, seminary, you're continuing on with that. Um, I, I love the way that your life illustrates how you're heading in one direction and God just kind of goes, no, I think I want you over here. And something that you never planned or thought for yourself, um, how God weaves together um, our life experiences to perfectly prepare you. Um, I'm sorry for the pain that has prepared you. I wish that you had not experienced the pain that you have experienced. And I see at the same time how God um, has used and is using and weaving together the painful parts of your life and your story so that when you sit down with someone who's experienced a mental health challenge or has experienced spiritual abuse or sexual abuse or, um, or racial um, trauma um, or just their soul is, is scattered, you can approach that from a place of compassion and a place of um, deep understanding. I've, I've often told that my, when my son Matthew, um, when he would talk to a therapist or a counselor, he could spot within a couple of seconds whether they had suffered. And if he didn't feel that they had suffered, he had no use for them because he knew they would not be able to connect with the profound suffering in his, his soul and his brain. And, and what I know about you, Kyle, just from what little I know, is that I doubt that that ever happens when someone sits down in front of you because you, you just genuinely convey, you know suffering, but you know a God who is there in the suffering. And I wanna talk about that more and more, but I um, thank you for sharing all of that with us. I wanna, I wanna take a little deeper dive into some of those topics. Um, you know, you've given us a broad outline of you know, spiritual abuse and racial trauma and how they can affect people mental health challenges, but I want to just talk a little bit about, um, let's just talk about, let's just talk about spiritual abuse. I was trying to decide whether to go soul care or spiritual abuse first, but I think I'll just kind of jump in with the spiritual abuse because that is probably uh, not a familiar topic to most people. And that's not a phrase that many people have really heard. They're not maybe exactly sure. Uh, I mean, it sounds terrible. It sounds like well, what is that? So maybe give us, if you could, just even an example of how somebody, um, of how spiritual abuse might happen in a church and how someone then might be able to recognize it. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you don't mind, so I'll take this in kind of layers. So sure. before getting to spiritual abuse, talking about just really briefly, just generally, what is abuse? Yes. And um, a very, and I'm going to try to be as simplistic as possible in trying to kind of lay this out um, because I think it's helpful just uh, in regards to grasping and understanding things that can be somewhat complex. So when you think about abuse, abuse is essentially what happens when someone misappropriates their power towards another person. Mm -hmm. And so when I say misappropriates their power, it, we have to understand how power is supposed to be used according to God, according to Christ. And according to God, according to scripture, power is, a, is something that is given for the purposes of empowering other people. And so when we have power, whatever power we have, we are supposed to, we are empowered to serve other people in empowering them. You know, and so power is a tool to lift up, to elevate, to exalt, to encourage and to empower others. The misappropriation of power is when we use power for self-exaltation at the expense of others. So a very, a very simple way that I put it is uh, abuse of power occurs when the powerful use their power to empower other powerful people at the expense of the powerless or those who lack their power. And so whenever, we, whenever you have any kind of abusive dynamic, that's, that's what's happening. 
So when we think about spiritual abuse, and I, I would put spiritual abuse kind of as an umbrella, and then you have a lot of things that kind of sit under that umbrella, and, whether, and different things that can happen that are abusive, but when there's a weaponization of faith, then it becomes an, also a form of spiritual abuse. And so faith is power. Uh, spiritual, someone who has a, a, is an authority figure in the realm of faith is, a, is one of the most powerful people in an individual's life because they are someone who's being entrusted with another person's soul. And so we all trust people to various degrees. We, we can trust our parents for nourishment and for care. We can trust our government to, uh, you know, to provide uh, measures of protection and, and economic stability. Uh, we can, um, uh, even again, police officers, we can entrust them with being civil servants and being able to protect and serve. Uh, so there are different kinds of people who we entrust with different measures of power. When it comes to someone who has spiritual authority, we are entrusting our very soul to them. And so when that, when that trust, when that kind of power is weaponized for the purposes of empowering them or empowering someone else with that kind of power at the expense of someone who does not have power, who is the one entrusting, spiritual abuse has occurred. And so to give you, you know, I can to give you various examples, when someone takes the precious word of God, which is supposed to be a bomb for the whole hurting, which is supposed to be an, a, an encouragement for the weak, it's supposed to uplift and to, and, to, and to build up God's people. When someone uses that as a tool for manipulation, uh, for gaslighting, to dehumanize or to justify oppression, or to, uh, to just, yeah, to do any of those list of those things, what they are doing is they're weaponizing an aspect of faith in order to further marginalize or, uh, or empower themselves and remove power for another person. When someone uses prayer uh, and, or weaponizes prayer in order to remove power. So I'll give you an example. So, and this, this happens all the time. When uh, someone has something that they want to use as, as, as they want to correct somebody in or they want to rebuke somebody. And so they do it through prayer. Where instead of praying kind of a collective communal prayer, They'll, they'll pray, but the whole prayer, they'll be focusing on that individual and bringing up that person's, whatever, they, whatever perceived sin they have, they'll bring it up in pay, prayer. So now they've, they, what is supposed to be a, a grace for communion with God is now being used as a weapon to target against somebody to tear them down. So again, so you can I, have- Can I pause just a second? I'm, I'm, you used yeah, two absolutely. words that, yeah, no, two words that, um, and you just explained, but the term weaponized, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it's something that I hear often, but, but it's always good to know kind of like what you mean. And you, you gave an example there of how prayer is used as a weapon that, that, that made sense. And also you use the term gaslighting. Um, mm -hmm. and there might be folks who are, that's a term they've heard, but they might not necessarily have a great, um, you know, um, understanding of, of how you're using it. So if you just keep yeah. going down the way you're going, but just maybe define those words really, um, oh, absolutely. Clearly. Yeah. And thank you. That's helpful. So, um, so I, I just recently watched one of those, like a, a murder mystery, where you know, where you have something like who, you know, who done it, and what, they, what weapon did they use in order to do this crime? And you typically have you have things that we understand as weapons, such you know, and then you have things that are not typically understood as weapons that can be used as weapons. And so, a lamp can be weaponized. You know, a, a book can be weaponized if it's like a dictionary, <laughs> you know, and so there's something to be weaponized is something that is, is something that is not a weapon that is used as a weapon or transformed into a weapon. That's helpful. So when you, yeah. And so when you think about someone weaponizing prayer, weaponizing scripture, weaponizing worship, what we're talking about is these are things or tools or even graces of God that are given to uplift, to, to heal, to comfort but they're being weaponized, they're being transformed into something used to wound. And mm -hmm. so something that is actually a tool for healing, being used as something to wound is something being weaponized. That's good, that's helpful, that's helpful. Yeah, and so and we're thinking about gaslighting. Gaslighting is essentially the idea that uh, of using, using manipulative tactics, whether it be speech or actions, to cause someone to question the very sense of reality. And so they question what's really real and are, are made to believe uh, that what is a false reality is actually a real reality. 
and uh, and so you, there's numerous ways in this this, this can happen in relationships. Someone's someone knows that um, what they just experienced. So they just experienced abuse. So they just experienced hate, and a gaslighter will try to use uh, manipulative tactics to have that person question whether or not the hate that they just experienced is actually love okay. and that love is hate. Okay. So when you think about abusive relationships, especially dealing with dynamics of like a domestic abuse, what, what abusers will do is they will have you question whether love is really love and whether hate is really hate and have you flip those things. And so they are the one who, their hate is actually loving to you and those who actually love you and care for you are now hating you. And so you draw yourself to the abuser and you push away those who actually love you. That is so, so that's helpful. How that's really helpful. Yeah, really, really helpful. So, so with that, sorry, with, with those words kind of defined, you, you were talking about then spiritual abuse and you were giving the example of, you know, of somebody saying something and somebody else taking that using prayer as a way to, rebuke them or um, criticize them, but in a way that I would imagine it also ends up where you kind of, they're like plausible deniability. Oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't saying it like that and leaving the other person. And so that's where it feels like maybe gaslighting and weaponizing come together is, am I getting yes. that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's deeper layers when you're thinking about spiritual abuse, which is why I think spiritual abuse can be one of the most devastating forms of abuse is because with, with, with general gaslighting, it's psychological manipulation. When you think about gaslighting within the spiritual abuse realm, you're not only psychologically manipulating, but you're also spiritually manipulating. You're, you're causing people to think of what, what sin is righteous and what's righteous is sin. So I'm thinking about Proverbs where it says, uh, Proverbs 17, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both are like oh, an abomination to the Lord. Yeah. And so spiritual abuse and gaslighting is when someone causes someone to think that the reality of what is righteous is actually sin and the reality is what, of, of what is sinful is actually righteous. And so this happens with abuse of children in the church. This happens with the, uh, it happens across the board with any kind of form of spiritual abuse where someone is uh, weaponizing gifts of God, as I mentioned before, like prayers, Bible, the Bible, these things, but they're calling their interpretation, which is intended for evil, they're making you believe it's for good. And when your spirit, when, and even the Holy Spirit is telling you this is wrong, something's wrong here, something's off here, they're telling you, no, everything's at peace. And so they are manipulating this, the, your, your conscience, they're manipulating the spirit within you, uh, training you to resist the, the warning signs of the spirit and of the conscience and to embrace them. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and, so, the, yeah. and so there can be devastating a impact of, of spiritual abuse and trauma because what ends up happening for someone who has been experienced spiritual abuse as they develop spiritual trauma is the very good gifts of God that are meant to heal and, and, and build up are now things that devastate and wound. And mm. so prayer becomes a trigger for trauma. Uh, yeah. Bible reading becomes triggering. Mm. Worship becomes triggering. Community becomes triggering because these things which were are good were used for evil and, and, and manipulated and back and made backwards. Does that make sense? And so oh, yeah. it, it, it can have a, a devastating complex, effect. It sounds like a very complex dynamic and um, that it might take people a while to realize that that's what they're experiencing. So, and I think you even referred to that yourself that, you know, um, in the church, I believe you said that, that you were in, it, it took you a while to realize that that's what was even happening to yeah. you and your family. Um, as a trauma counselor. Yes. <laughs> and if well. you so as a trauma just... counselor had a, you know, took you a while to realize that you can imagine how somebody without your training, without your experience might, might live in that kind of situation for months or, or even years before they, before they see, um, and they might not even know what to call it, even if they start to see it. So like, so maybe even sharing from your own experience or just, um, other people that you've worked with, when somebody begins to feel this sense of, I'm, I'm assuming it's a feeling of discomfort, like something's not right, but they don't know how to identify it. How do they begin to um, move through that, past that? Um, what, are some, what are some steps that they might need to take um, if they feel like they're experiencing that in their, in their church or community? 
Yeah. So um, the first thing that I would say is that um, it's very common uh, for people who have trauma, and that's probably another word that I, 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 I'd like to define in a moment as well, but people who have trauma most often don't realize that they have trauma. And so when it comes to trauma care, one of the most central aspects of it is come walking alongside someone, helping them come to terms with the very reality that they are actually traumatized. And so people can have everything from personality shifts to uh, all a host of things, and it just becomes their new normal. They just kind of just say, that, oh, this is my lot in life. And they just go about thinking that just simply, again, the reality shifted was changed when in reality they are carrying with themselves trauma and people can go an entire life uh, not realizing that they're actually being held back and hindered because of trauma. And so um, th there's a host of different things that I, that, that I think can be listed in regards to kind of signs or symbols of, hey, you may be traumatized. I, I, I've given a, li a, a list in other places, give you really quick examples. Uh, one of the things that I find very common is, again, as I mentioned, personality shifts. Uh, people who, go, who are typically very extroverted become profoundly introverted. Mm -hmm. And they can think that it's just a personality shift when in reality, what has happened there is that their, 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 their mind has developed defense mechanisms uh, to prevent compounding pain. And so, um, and so they, they, de they develop, they become kind of a clue. They begin cutting people off. They don't even have the energy to actually engage like they used to, because most of the energy is just spent trying to cope in environments rather than actually thrive within them. And of course, the reverse can be true. Someone can be an introvert and actually become extroverted, and that extrovertedness can be a way of, of kind of de um, um, navigating spaces without having to feel the, com the, the discomfort of actually having to be transparent and real. So there's kind of a superficial extrovertedness that, that kind of masks the pain. You know, and so those kinds of things, emotional outburst, um, um, and, uh, and when I say emotional outburst, or what I mean by that, and I'm not using the term outburst in a negative sense, but it's basically when you lack control of your emotional faculties. So just crying spells out of nowhere. Uh, what's important to understand is that when someone has experienced trauma, there's a kind of a calibration that takes place both psychologically and emotionally, and I'd argue spiritually as well. And that, that recalibration is your mind's way of trying to make sense to what it has experienced, the devastation it has experienced, and process it. And in that processing period, um, there can be a lot of crying, a lot of, of anger due to injustice that just comes, that leashes out. There can just be a lot of emotional, kind of emotional roller coaster that's happening. And people can just say, well, I'm just emotional. When in reality, your, your brain is trying to, and your emotions is trying to recalibrate based upon the emotional and psychological devastation that it's experienced. Mm. Uh, Kay, That's if really I could, helpful. real quickly, yeah, keep going, um, just keep take a step back and, and define a couple of terms. So when I say, when I'm talking about trauma, uh, one of the very simple ways that I've defined trauma is that trauma is haunting pain. Um, it, when you think about a haunting, a haunting is what happens when basically a ghost lives in a place and somebody moves into that place and the ghost terrorizes them, making it uninhabitable. Uh, when you think about trauma, trauma is, is, is a kind of pain that haunts an individual throughout their life. And so two people can experience a profoundly painful moment. One can, it can be a mo a simply a moment for it, and then they move on from that. But for another person, it ends up haunting them. And now when I talk about pain, I'm not talking about a stub toe or a paper cut. I'm talking about a profoundly painful moment that, is, that basically rocks somebody at their very core. And so again, two people can experience a profoundly painful moment. And for one, it's a moment, and then they're able to move on. But for another person, it haunts them. And so trauma is, again, is that haunting pain that someone carries with them. Depression is more uh, something that in relation to kind of a, 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 a zapping of energy, uh, whether that energy be towards uh, joy or happiness or just even when it comes to relating to other people. And, uh, and again, so it can take many different forms depending on what we're talking about or what kind of depression. Uh, but the, the, the primary distinction would, for, for me would be that um, – Depression in and of itself can take on many different forms and have many different causes, while um, depression, or while trauma is the food of, again, haunting pain, and one of the symptoms of that haunting pain can be depression, usually birthed out of a feeling of hopelessness. Mm, that's good. That's helpful. So I want to move kind of in our last part of our conversation to talk about something that is so dear to your heart, something that I'm learning about 
Um, and, and that is racial trauma, particularly as it, um, I mean, it happens to probably anyone of color, but um, even as it happens or shows up in, in the church, in the body of Christ. Um, so talk to us just a little bit about what is it, um, what is it, well, talk about that, but also what are, what are white brothers and sisters missing? What is it that we might not understand, we might think we understand, but we don't understand? Um, what are some things that you can, first of all, just tell us about it in general, and then what is it that we might, that might be sliding past us that we're not catching? Yes. So um, the way that I define uh, racial trauma in light of the definitions that I've already given regarding uh, trauma as well as pain, um, racial trauma is the haunting pain of racialization um, that afflicts individuals to such a degree that it prohibits comprehensive flourishing, whether it be psychological, emotional, spiritual, or, um, or physiological. And so again, it's a haunting pain of racialization. Now, when I use the term racialization, uh, what I'm referring to is the, is, is the reality that we live in a society that has completely 100% bought into the social construct of race. Um, biblically speaking, there is only one race, the human race. And if you wanted to be theological, we could say two races, the human race and Adam, and then the, the race in Christ of the new man, the, the one new man in Christ. But humans make up one, one race, but the, the social construct of race is this idea that, um, you can, that people belong to different racial groups based upon uh, biology and various regions. And with that comes conceptions of superiority. And so the, the, the form of racialization that America has bought into is the idea that there is the white race, which is uh, essentially supreme. And then there are other racial groups that are put on various levels within, some, uh, within a racial caste system as it relates to dignity and honor. Um, this is where we get categories like white supremacy. White supremacy is the embrace of this idea that the white race is superior to other races. Racial trauma um, deals with the, 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 the traumatic impact on people who are on who are placed lower on this racial caste system it's it's essentially dealing with the trauma that is that is inflicted upon them due to this construct and so the, the, it's again the haunting pain caused by the embrace of this lie of of racial distinctions or that of different races and so I, I would argue that yes we are made up of a multitude of ethnicities and there is beauty in the unity amidst the diversity of what we see in Revelation seven nine but the embrace of the lie of race has caused a chasm. Uh, amongst various peoples, and that chasm continues to grow. And what we're seeing in our society now is that it, can, it, it it's expanding, that chasm is expanding. And I think one of the reasons why it is expanding is because of a general lack of compassion and empathy um, as it relates to how those who are not white living in this racialized society are impacted by the reality of white supremacy and those ideas. Mm -hmm. And not just the, the blatant aspects of white supremacy, such as cross burnings and white hoods, but also the various ways in which we as a society um, elevate uh, the culture of, of, of being white and the identity of being white, how, how we elevate that over against other people who are not white. Mm -hmm. and, and so... My work in racial trauma is seeking to both raise awareness, uh, primarily of how this is impacting the church, um, as well as seeking to help people heal uh, from the experiences that they've had in the church, uh, specifically majority white churches, um, regarding the trauma that has been inflicted on them because of that, the lack of compassion and empathy that I described. So give, give, um, give us some examples. Um, I mean, my mind, my own mind floods with a few, but I just, I'd like to hear it from you. What, what kinds of things on a practical level are you talking about? Because yes. when I talk to, um, when I talk to, um, white people, particularly, you know, I've talking to a lot of people of color, but talking to, um, 
sometimes the response is, I am not a racist. In fact, it's a very offensive term for a lot of white people who, who would never, ever, ever be in their car chasing down Ahmaud Arbery, who could never see themselves putting um, a knee on, on an unarmed person of color, a black man. I mean, th that is so deeply offensive. And so in fact, many people say, I'm, I'm colorblind. You know, I don't even see color. Um, and so to them, that in their heart, to the best of their understanding, they don't feel like they're exhibiting any kind of racist behavior. They don't feel, they feel like they're treating everybody the same. I hear this over and over and over again from some really good hearted people, people who love Jesus. And so they're struggling mm -hmm. to, to understand um, um, some of the, some of the rhetoric that is, that is um, out there of know that, you know, the church needs to be different or um, we as believers need to be different. And there are just some people who are finding that um, they don't see themselves in any way, shape or form as being racist. And so even those words feel like, and, and yet you and I both know that the body of Christ is not always a safe place. Um, and particularly in a majority white church, even where people love Jesus and are trying to do well. So what is it that we might be missing? What would you say to someone who is genuinely um, trying to understand where they are, are not getting it, where, where, um, what is it, what needs to happen so that um, we really, where, as you say, people of color can flourish, um, not just in our country, but, but in the body of Christ. I know that was kind of a long-winded setup for a question, but it's it's really just you know I know you do this every day. You're talking to people, some who are are very belligerent and are not do not have a heart of wanting to understand, but for somebody who is genuinely trying to understand and they're not catching it, they're missing it. How how can you help? What can you help us? How can you help us? Absolutely. So first, let me say this and say that one of the, 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 the primary work that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer is he sanctifies them in divine love, love for God, love for the body of Christ, and then love for their neighbors, love for the world. And so the Holy Spirit in the work of sanctification is sanctifies us in love. And so I'm, I'm confident that the majority of my white brothers and sisters, even if I, to some extent, don't believe that they're understanding or grasping the, the challenges that are faced, do desire to understand, do desire to want to grow in these things. And I think that that's a very, very important place to start because society is very much is polarized and is a massive chasm where everyone is talking and yelling at one another. No, there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of anger and rage. And it's by our love for one another that we testify to the fact that we are the people of God. And so we have to start in a posture of of trust and understanding that we are family and trying to work through these things in fa as family so we can be a light to the world rather than mimic the world. Hmm. Now, with, with that being said, um, I, I do think that um, theology is important. And when it comes to theology, the understanding that um, we are part of a fallen, we are, we are part of, we are, we are not only fallen ourselves, we're not only sinners ourselves who have blind spots, but we can also be uh, self-deceived. All of us know this, that when it comes to our emotions, there's many times where we believe with all of our emotional power that something is good and we learn that it's not. We believe with all our intellectual power that something is true, and yet it turns out to be false. We are not emotionally or, or, or intellectually consistent or pure. All of us have our faults. And so when it comes to these kinds of things, I think one of the things that does have to kind of start the conversations is a posture of humility and recognizing that there are, are, are people who have a lived experience where they have their reality um, is what they are testifying to and a humility to recognize, okay, I have my own word, my own perspective, my own you know, sense of reality. Let me listen to what someone else is telling me and let them enter into my reality with the willingness to understand that I may not be seeing something rather than enter it with suspicion you know, and, 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 and doubt. And I think that if we do that, there can be a lot of growth and a lot of learning. 
Uh, I'll give you some, uh, some quick examples of ways in which we can, things can be said without actually thinking through the impact of it. So one of the things you mentioned, the idea of being colorblind. Uh, when someone says that they're colorblind, well, the problem with that is in order to, in what that is communicating is that in order for me to have relationship with you, I have to bypass your color. It doesn't look at color and say color, your color is beautiful, is a demonstration of the wisdom of God. It says your color is a hindrance. And so therefore I must be blind to it in order for us to actually have relationship. Um, growing up as a kid, I had, to, did you ever see those books, Magic Eye, where they had like all these different colors and you would have to yeah. stare at it until you see yeah. the image? Yeah. Well, God has created humanity with, with multiple, as a multi-ethnic and multicultural uh, community. And it's when we look at all the various colors and all the diversity of that, that we're able, and we look hard enough that we can see past that at the manifold wisdom of God. And if we remove the reality of color, as we look on, we do not get to see the glorious wisdom of God in his diversity and the unity in diversity that brings him glory. And so even the language of saying colorblind uh, to some, it may seem like what I'm it may seem, and I, I know this is the intention. What I'm saying is that your color is not a hindrance, but to the person who is a person of color, what they're hearing is you must be blind. You, you're not affirming the beauty of my diversity. You're yeah. saying that you have to not look at it in order for there to be actual relationship, relational building. And so that would be one example. Now, on a bigger, more arching um, uh, scheme here, one of the things that I typically do when I'm doing teachings on these things is I draw a giant circle on a board and I label inside the circle church. And then outside of that, I draw different cultures and ethnicities. And so I may say, um, you know, African, you know, black culture, uh, you know, uh, white culture, uh, Zambian culture, Chinese culture, Vietnamese culture. So I put all these cultures outside. And then I point an arrow to that circle saying that this is what the church is supposed to look like. It's supposed to be a multitude of different peoples who come together and become a, a multi-ethnic, multicultural bride. That's what a church is supposed to be. What often happens, though, is white culture inserts itself into that bu bubble, into that circle as the church. And then all the other cultures and ethnicities visit that visit that white culture and must oblige to the white cultural paradigm, which has established itself as essentially being the church. And so I, I remember I wrote an article a while back called When the Church Colonizes Femininity. And what I said in that article was I was primarily speaking to about uh, up for black women, but it's in black and uh, POC women. But I think it refers to, you know, this in, in a lot of different ways where specifically for black women, there can be this kind of paradigm for what it means to be a godly woman. What is femininity in the church? And the picture that's given is kind of a soft uh, spoken Southern antebellum white woman and all other women are told that you need to measure up to this in order to be perceived as godly. And so women from different cultural backgrounds with different, um, different personality types and different cultural expressions, they, they are considered uh, godly to the degree that they measure up to this. And if they don't, then they're considered to be immature. And of course, we know that doesn't just, well, doesn't, it's not just women of color, but also white women who don't measure up to that also are, right. are labeled the same way. But that's, that's an example of one of the cultural paradigms where the, the church and, and, and a Christian woman is made to be a specific thing and then everyone else has to conform to that. There's a specific kind of music that everyone else must conform to. There's a specific, and they can go anything from um, political parties to uh, social beliefs to um, economics to, um, again, culture and ethnicity to, it can be all a host of different things where it's set up as a paradigm, but the paradigm is actually a cultural expression, specifically a white cultural expression, and everyone else has to measure up to that in order to be considered um, Christ-like. And, and, and when they're dealing with racial trauma in the church, what it's primarily speaking to is the, the devastation the haunting pain that is created uh, when minorities do not want to lose their sense of self or their sense of cultural and ethnic identity in order to receive Christ. And the, the trauma that happens for their refusal to give up who they are 
uh, when the dominant culture is saying you must conform in order to be perceived as faithful. And see, that's where the spiritual abuse dynamic actually comes in because yeah. now faith is being weaponized. Faith is a tool to force conformity rather than faith being a, uh, a, um, a service to build people's relationship with God and to build community. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as we start winding down, so if you were telling, um, you know, my church or um, another church who was genuine and sincere in wanting, you've already talked about like first steps as I heard you was really listen, just listen, you know, listen to people's stories, listen to their experiences, come from that place of humility you know, what, what else are there a couple other things that you would say to the body of Christ that is trying to address um, our very broken world, our very bo broken country, um, particularly around um, the, the pain that people of color are experiencing. If we really want to move, walk together through that, um, how can we begin to walk together? Just give us quickly a couple things, and then I want to ask you a closing question. Yes. So, um, so just to be uh, really transparent uh, with you, I, what I would say is this, is that, um, uh, so for one, much of the trauma that I encounter from uh, minorities who have experienced racial trauma in the church is people who have been um, essentially expelled from their churches or pushed, forced out of their churches simply for trying to help their white brothers and sisters see their perspective. And because that perspective was different, they were essentially pressured out. And so what I mentioned before when I talked about power dynamics, and I, one of the things that I said is that when someone has given power, is entrusted with power, when that power is abused, it can lead to devastation. Well, within the body of Christ, there's power in the, in the reality of being a family. Uh, the church, and especially for minorities, we enter into majority white churches, and we, we've entered into those spaces on the promise that this is a covenant, that this is a faithful relationship. And let me, let me give you this example. Uh, I give this typically in a lot of my talks where I, I lay out an, an, an illustration, a story of a woman in, an, in a domestic uh, abuse situation where uh, she is being um, harmed by her husband. And she tells her husband that what he's doing is harming her, is hurting her. And he promises he's going to change. So she sticks around. He hurts her again. And she, promise, he, he, she tells him how she, what he's doing. He says he's going to stick around. And this is the cycle that goes on. Well, the same thing happens within churches. The church membership is a covenant. It's a covenant of family. We're going to be a family. And minorities are coming saying, what you're doing is hurting us. And then the promises are given saying, well, we're going to do better. And then the cycle constantly repeats itself over and over and over again until you end up having people who have been profoundly traumatized by the experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so what I would say is that, so one of the things with me, even as I look at all these, um, the, the, the deaths that have been happening, um, as I mentioned in, early on, I am a former gang member. It's been over, well over 20 years now, but that is part of my past. And as someone who does have racial PTSD as it relates to police officers, whenever I see a police officer in my rear view, the lights going off, I literally have, have to fight against panic attacks. And, um, and, uh, and again, my PTS. And one of the things that I'm constantly aware of is, is that my nervousness, or if I have a panic attack while I'm getting pulled over, that can be seen as suspicious and things can escalate. And part of me knows that if I was to be gunned down because I was a perceived threat, that I have faith family who will assume and believe whatever criminalizations are made about me in my past. Yeah. And so there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a traumatic reality of my faith family, my family in the faith, they are going to be more quick to believe whatever um, negative things are said about me then they ought to believe my years of faithfulness and service to the church and, and the devastation that will cause, cause my family while people are believing these things. Because, again, people like George Floyd had a, had a bad past, but he was a believer. You know, m most of the people that I know of who have died, who have become hashtags, were believers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's, one of the things that I would say is that, that there's more at stake than just simply mere disagreements. Because what, what, what black mothers in the church are seeing in these things is what could happen to their black children. 
Uh, what black church members are saying is what could happen to them or their brother or sister. And when the response from their faith family is one of indifferent apathy or an embrace of criminalization of victims, what they're hearing is, this is what would happen to me. Mm. You know, and that is, pro it's profoundly disorienting to be in a place where um, you don't know if you're safe because you know that if things were to go a certain kind of way, very quickly, it is likely that you would no longer be perceived as family, but to be perceived as as whatever the media presents you as, your worst moments. Kyle, that is... <clears throat> that is really hard. That is really hard. It is. Um, I, I, and I'm just... One of the so one of the, uh, so let me let me if I could say this real quick because I think this is super important. Um, whenever someone experiences trauma, their 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 minds develop defense mechanisms to avoid compounding that trauma. And so we can understand if a woman has been assaulted, for her to be cautious and even susp suspicious around men in her healing process because of what has happened to her. Yet at the same time, when minorities uh, found themselves, find themselves being cautious and suspicious around white people based upon their lived experiences, they're quick to be called racist. Mm -hmm. When in reality, many of them are trying not to be further traumatized because of the experiences of apathy and indifference that they've had. Mm -hmm. And so, they, but the trauma is compounded because it's like, yeah. oh, you, now you don't feel safe or comfortable around me. Oh, you're racist. Yeah. And so... Uh, one of the things for me, and I'll just, I'll just be transparent for a moment and say why, why I had to, my family had to get out of being in a predominantly white church, not, not just talking about the, the trauma and abuse we experienced, but even moving beyond that, was because of a real sense of paranoia, where it's like you try to worship, and as you're worshiping, you don't know whether that person standing next to you, praising Jesus right next to you, actually values your life, would actually value your life if it was taken prematurely. And being in a space where you don't know because people are either silent or they have spoken maybe on social media about where they stand on these things, you're left in a place where it's, how can I worship God when I don't know if the people around me actually value my life or believe that I am, I'm, I'm worth it, or my life is worth it. And, and so I, I think that when we're thinking about racial trauma, when I'm dealing with these things and doing the counseling, um, it's, it's so deep because what we're, and, and even when we're th thinking about the depression, thinking about suicidal ideations and all these kinds of things, uh, I'm dealing with, I, I'm caring for people who are in a situation where everyone whom they've known in the faith, all the Christians they know, even my, all the Christians that my family, my family has known, all the Christians my children have grown up knowing, abandoned us, you know, uh, be in, in, in our, our, our abusive church context. And so we're dealing, I'm dealing with Christians, my, it's primarily minority Christians who have spent their entire lives or years in communities where they believe that they were loved. And within a moment, they go from believing that they are loved to not knowing whether or not they're hated or not, or whether or not they, the person standing next to them who called them brother for years every day would actually see them as a brother if they were gunned down in the street. And that kind of, the disorienting impact, the devastating impact of being in a place where you no longer know whether or not the people you call family actually love you can lead to a profound degree of hopelessness. And, 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 um, and in that space, so when I'm talking about racial trauma in the church, I'm not just talking about people who are hurt. I'm talking about people who have been devastated to such a profound degree that they're wondering whether or not they should hold on to Jesus. Um, their trauma keeps them from holding on to Jesus in some places because, again, talking about spiritual trauma. So Bible reading is now hard because Bible reading was weaponized against them. Um, prayer is now hard because prayer has been weaponized against them. And so people who are holding on to a thin thread who cannot grasp the means of grace that God has given because of how it's been weaponized against them, who want to go to church, but even church is triggering because in their churches, all the people who called them brother or sister 
n- they now they don't know if their lives even matter to them. What what was what we're dealing with is a is a situation that is is very very difficult to describe in regards to the depth of pain um, that it has caused. So um, I'm hopeful. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. So what? Where? Where is your? Where is your hope? You know what? Um, because you spoke to a, a true reality of a sense of hopelessness that has got to be building. Um, and and so, how can we interrupt that? How can we, as the body of Christ, be what we're intended to be? How can we be living out? You've already spoken about love. That, you know, that that's the fruit of the spirit, that's the transformative power of the gospel, that's when the Holy Spirit is at work in us, is producing love. And I know that, and I know that that, at the end of the day, has got to be where we all land and live, is in in the love of Christ for each other. Um, but as we kind of wrap this up, Kyle, so just take this moment um, to maybe speak to someone, um, a person of color, a brother or sister of color, particularly who has um, experienced much of what you have just expressed so vulnerably and so transparently, but what hope can you give to them? And then what hope can you, do you have for the body of Christ as, as we move forward? Cause I don't, we don't want to stay here. We don't want to stay here. This is not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be doing things differently. We're supposed to be um, a completely different picture to the world and we're not. So first of all, to somebody who, a uh, person of color who might have experienced some of the wounds, and then what is your hope for, for the body of Christ? Yeah. So, um, I will, so I guess going back about a year, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I remember sitting down with my wife, looking at each other in the eyes and asking one another if we should walk away from the faith. Um, I know not many people have had those moments where they have literally put everything on the table and said, should we walk away? And um, we, we literally had a list of all the reasons why the Christianity and the, and the faith we've known has failed us and whether or not we should walk away. And we still love Jesus and we're still believers for this reason no matter how long that list was on the other side of it was Jesus has never forsaken us. Mm-hmm. And, and in the midst of, of all the pain in the midst of all the, 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 the my, own, my own personal struggles with depression, everything else um, it really has come down to, and, and being in a place where the only person you have is Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and what I would say is, is this, is that, to those of you, so for first and foremost, you're not crazy. Um, what you have experienced and what you are experiencing is not your fault. Um, and it, it shouldn't be this way. And so to those who have experienced spiritual abuse, who have experienced racial trauma in the church, uh, which is a form of spiritual abuse, what I would say to you is, one, I want you to know that um, other people have gone through what you've, you, you have gone through, that um, you are not alone, not by a long shot, that uh, Christ is with you and Christ walks with you and Christ understands what you are going through. The, the death of Christ was a racially traumatizing event as he's tortured by the Romans and mocked by his own ethnic people, um, as, and, and ultimately, uh, again, scoffed at with King of the Jews written on his cross. And so Jesus knows what racial trauma is. He knows what abandonment is. He knows what it is like to be abandoned by his own community of faith. And so even in the most profoundly and devastating uh, realities of spiritual trauma, Christ is there. And he is there to walk with you and he's there to lift you up and that um, you are not alone. Um, I never used to be somebody who was uh, into like uh, cosmology, like looking at the stars and all those kinds of things. Uh, But I've developed a deeper uh, um, appreciation for the night sky. And the reason for that is when you look at the night sky, it's, um, it's, at least where I'm from, it's black. And, And all you see is just blackness. And, and one of the dreams that I've always had was to go to um, see the Grand Canyon. 
I wanted to see the, the vastness of it. And I wanted to just behold that in the majesty of God. And I got an opportunity to go to Colorado, Arizona, and I visited the Grand Canyon. And I remember getting lost. I didn't leave before it gotten dark outside. And so I'm lost at the Grand Canyon. And I look up at the sky, though, and the sky is completely lit because there's like an infinite amount of stars in the sky. And uh, what hit me in that moment was this, that no matter how black um, things appear to be, that there is always beauty and there's always light. And with every single person who's watching this, no matter how dark um, things are, I know without a doubt that there is light in your life. Uh, there's, there's, there's beauty in your life. And, um, and even if because of their own sense of hopelessness, because of the own sense of despair, or because of the own sense of just um, the feelings that you may have at this moment, it may be hard to see as it's hard for me to see now where I am in Atlanta, but I promise you that there's always a perspective that when you look at your, your life, there is shining stars and you are more, worth more than all the stars in the sky. And so when it comes to dynamics of abuse, when it comes to the issues of uh, trauma, um, I know how it can make you feel like, I mean, just, just, it can make you feel worthless, make you feel like you're not worth advocating for, you're not worth being protected, you're not worth being supported but you are worth more than all the stars in the sky. And even when other people don't know that, Jesus knows that. And Jesus walks with you and will walk with you. Um, when it comes to the church, I, I want to be as honest as I can here and say that it, hope fluctuates with me. I have not, I guess you could say, I'm not free of my own depression. I'm not free of my own really, really dark days. Um, uh, I've had some of those really, really dark days recently. Um, but when those, I have those dark days and when I am more kind of uh, consumed by uh, the darkness, what I try to do is to remember that God is, is active. Um, the Holy Spirit is active. And even when I'm not able to see that activity, I know that God is moving and God is doing things because God has said that he is going to accomplish his work and the spirit is at work and he's working in believers. He is sanctifying them in divine love. And we will see revelation seven, nine of every nation, tribe and tongue worshiping in unity. And, um, and I want to be a part of that. I want to, uh, uh, encourage and pursue and help people be a part of that. And my encouragement, um, to my white brothers and sisters would be that, with the embrace of humility, as you enter conversations with black and brown uh, faith family, you are opening yourself up to the opportunity of one of the greatest things that God is doing in all the cosmos, which is unifying the people, uh, the, unifying his people. And, and, and all that it really honestly takes is just being willing to enter into these conversations with the humility to be willing to learn, listen, and, and, and possibly change perspectives rather than doubling down. And with that, I'll leave it at saying that the doubling down is not merely simply being opinionated, but the doubling down that is happening is causing profound pain and causing profound hurt. And so uh, what I'm encouraging you guys to is, all of you to, is not just simply sit down and have a conversation over, uh, over a coffee. You can do it or you cannot. It's optional. What I'm saying is, beloved, your lack of humility in entering these conversations is devastating people whom Christ died for. Mm -hmm. And uh, in love, as a brother, I want to see everyone receive the full reward uh, for uh, their their works. And I want everyone to hear those words, good and faithful servant. I want that for everyone. And so um, press on. All of us need to press on and recognize that there is a profound cost if we don't. And so let's press on. Kyle, thank you so much. Um, anybody who's watching as we wrap up, Kyle's words that um, you are worth more than all the stars in the sky. I hope you hold on to that beautiful thought. And I hope for those of us who are believers in Jesus to believe that God is at a good and mighty and beautiful work of bringing unity to his body 
um, those two pieces, those two words, Kyle. Thank you for talking. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for talking um, honestly about your own struggles with um, suicide, suicidal thoughts, depression, um, how that doesn't always go away, but your belief and your clinging to the hope that Jesus is always there and he will never fail you and that there is more ahead. Those are great words as we finish out Suicide Prevention Month. And um, can't thank you enough, Kyle. Um, it's so good to be with you and I look forward to our next conversation. God bless you. Thank you. It's my privilege.